Hello, we would like to share with you our interview with a scientist featuring Dr. Dre, a marine mammal scientist. This video is created by Jessica Rotondo, Aiden Webb, and Gavin Reinhardt. Dr. Dre is an interdisciplinary community scientist, as well as many other ists, a naturalist, an artist, biologist, and conservationist, with a passion for the ocean. She is drawn to understanding our human relationship with the natural world and ways we can help preserve, protect, and sustainably make use of the limited resources nature provides. Dr. Dre spent a decade in the Caribbean organizing historical and current marine mammal stranding data for the Eastern Caribbean, as well as organizing trainings and workshops for the Spanish, English, French, and Dutch Caribbean. Capacity building involved training both live and dead response to facilitate the creation of marine mammal stranding networks in these island nations and coordinating supplies and global expertise. We asked her to share with us in detail the work she did while she was in the Caribbean. All right, so uh, this is Gavin, Aiden, and Jessica's group, and we're interviewing Dr. Dre. And uh, so our first question for you, Dr. Dre, is uh, how did you get involved studying marine mammals? I started working with marine mammals completely by accident. So I was really interested in contaminants and how contaminants were affecting our environment. And I just moved here, actually, to Woods Hole um, from California and was really interested in PCBs and the effect of PCBs and realized, wow, there's a super fun site, which is a contaminated site that exists in New Bedford, which is like right across the way. Um, and nobody had actually looked at what was happening to higher trophic level animals. And the higher trophic level animals we have here are seals. So that was the species I started looking at. I was thinking about how high up can we go to look at something that's the closest to us that we can see what the effects would be. And so that's how seals became my study <laughs> organism now for over 20 years, was really looking at seals and the effects of contaminants. And that's cool. So the next question is kind of multi-part. Why did you study marine mammals and why should people be interested in marine mammals in tropical environments? Marine mammals are a great way to communicate science. Um, nothing against plankton, I would say, nothing against the small things, but there's something that people become aware of a little bit more, kind of perk up, think about a little bit more of the connection to themselves um, when you start talking about marine mammals. So that's a great reason in itself to study them, but also because of that connection to humans. To me, they're very close to what we eat, where we live, and they're very much uh, impacted by the same threats that we are in that, in that sense, like contaminants. And so that's a great reason to study them, to understand our system and ourselves a little bit more. Um, and they're also just incredibly interesting. They're incredibly fascinating parts of our ecosystem that we still have so much to learn about. Um, and in the tropical marine mammal world or setting, we know even less. We know less about those animals, where they go, how they live, what they eat. Um, we're just discovering new species or new populations still at this time. And that's how much we don't know about the species. Do you think there's more human marine mammal interaction in tropical environments than there are in temperate, or do you think it's kind of evenly spread out? Hmm, that's a good question. I think there are different threats or different types of interactions, um, but then we also have to think about the density of people or the impacts of people. And I guess you can think of a big ship trans, you know, going transatlantic is, has more impact than one person on a beach. Um, but there are differences in just the concentrations of people in tropical areas and those direct impacts. But then there's also the indirect impacts. What are we putting in our oceans, the plastics that came from someplace else that may now be impacting those animals in the tropics. So it's a tough one to, to yeah. kind of answer <laughs> yes or no to. And then so like, in respect to the tropical environment, why do we want to protect the marine mammals found in the tropics? And then... Um, do you think protecting marine mammals creates like an umbrella effect for other creatures that live in the tropical environment? So marine mammals definitely have so much value for in, in tropical regions for reasons that we may not see or even think about in our own region, say North, North American continents in the northern part. Um, in the tropics, there are still people that consume marine mammals. Um, we 
don't necessarily unless we're in the Arctic region. And that's really important. It's a really important part of the culture and the life in those places. And it's also a way to understand the environment, the oceans, and the impacts that are happening, which are unique in those regions as well, and the threats. Um, and absolutely, it does create an umbrella kind of, I'd say, culture even of one person cares, the next person cares. And that's a great way to educate people about the importance and significance of their own well-being and have um, pride and respect for where they are and have that much more impact in their lives by caring about right now. So we see that a lot in the regions as well. And could you just give us a quick brief overview of what you did with tropical marine mammals while you were down there? Yeah, so for many years I was um, learning. I like to say I was learning. I wasn't teaching. I was learning from communities in the Eastern Caribbean and doing stranding response trainings for emerging and developing marine mammal stranding groups throughout the Eastern Caribbean. So focusing on uh, Dutch, English, Spanish, and English speaking Caribbean uh, islands and countries. And basically giving the tools in the toolbox that we have here to others to respond to marine mammal stranding. So part of that was, again, just listening and learning about what differences existed before I went in and said, you should do something, <laughs> was really listening and learning to what their experiences were and sort of meshing those experiences together so that they could respond to things. So how much information do you think was available to the communities in that area about marine mammals before you had arrived and done your study? There was limited information about marine mammals lots of interest, lots of the desire to learn, and a big part of that is the language barrier of what resources are available and translated into those specific languages in these locations was a big part of it, um, and the resources and tools just to be able to understand what was happening. So um, even the most basic things like a pair of binoculars, just having resources to understand um, some of this so increasing just the capacity to be out there was something that um, was brought in, not necessarily by me, but by the interest of this is what we need, this is what we can have to understand what's happening. So we definitely, I think, made an impact on, on the knowledge base that was available for a wider group. Yeah, and so here comes the endemic question. So are there any marine mammals endemic to the tropics, but then I guess a better question would be, are there any marine mammals that hold a significant cultural value down there? Like we up here, humpback whales are very common, seals are pretty common, but down there, are there any marine mammals that hold that cultural influence over those people? That's a, a wonderful question. Um, I think there are species that have in categories that are important, again, like thinking about, they're, they're called blackfish, or, or the, the marine mammals that are consumed down there have historically been called blackfish, so pilot whales, um, false killer whales, orcas, um, and then there's a great interest in learning about sperm whales and sperm whale culture um, for people and the animals themselves down there, and humpback whales definitely hold a really important trait or quality in that they're born down there, so it's the, the breeding grounds and birthing grounds. Do you see that changing as more research comes out about the intelligence of the animals, or do you think that's just not the relationship they have with the animals? Many people do, I think, have a very keen interest in, in all of it, which is great. There's a scientific community, there's veterinary schools, there's researchers working in wonderful collaborations across countries and regionally with languages even coming together having just the most amazing um, just like knowledge research that's happening right now. So there's interest, there's uh, knowledge and learning that's happening I think, on many levels. What roles do you think marine mammals play in tropical marine environments? Marine mammals in tropical environments play very similar roles I think as they do here. Um, from being part of the greater ecosystem. So in some places, there are the top predators, orcas, there's many orcas in the Caribbean, um, and they have an 
really, really important role ecologically. Um, that's visible, right? Like they're kind of from the fear-centered change of ecology to the actual eating of animals <laughs> change in ecology. Um, and just the presence of those animals in their kind of ecosystem as a whole always has an important intrinsic value to it. So from eating smaller fish or controlling maybe certain populations that um, of fish species that could be changing in different areas, those are all things that all marine animals are important for in our, in our ecosystem, the role that they play. Um, and marine mammals in the tropics are playing the same roles as we see here. All right, then kind of building off of that, and so we hear about tropical environments as containing, you know, seagrass beds, beds, mangroves, and coral reefs, all those important ecosystems, but you don't really hear how marine mammals fit into those ecosystems, even though they're such an important part of our marine environment. So in your experience, like, how do those animals interact with those key ecosystems? Right, great question. So we know that we have manatees throughout the Caribbean waters, I mean, up through like Florida even, right, down, down um, as we go further south they eat grasses, sea bed or sea grasses. And so they're controlling in some respect seagrass beds and what's happening in those regions, which we know are important for fish nurseries. You know, that's where the baby fish are. So there's those interactions at that like grass level or you know, the, the plant level, I guess, of our ocean system. Um, and I know that um, animals also dig around for, for fish and sediment. And so you have like a turnover of what's happening in the bottom sediment coming up. And all of that activity influences other species and what they're able to access as well. So it's interesting because I think those studies are are happening or being addressed now. Those observational naturalist type of studies are just finally coming out of the into the literature. But we know these things and people can observe that for hundreds of years too. And then with the tropical environments being mostly like legotrophic. Is there a difference in feeding strategies that marine mammals have to employ? Because, you know, in the tropics, there's not much that are, you would assume for them to eat, being as there's not much primary production going on. So do we see where they kind of fast while they're down there, but then eat more as they come up north? Or is that, or is there like a continuous, they've developed strategies to feed there? That's a great question. And I, I, I think there's different, that's a great question. There's different strategies for different types of marine mammals. It's hard to put them all in like a, a box. But we know humpback whales are, are nursing and calving, so they may not be needing to feed that much when they're in that, that state of uh, their life cycle. So they come up to the northern waters to us to, to gorge themselves on lots and lots of fish, right? And um, so they can get that and have their calves. So it's a different strategy based on the huge migratory route. Um, and then there are other species that are even smaller fish and are very dependent reefs and fish that are, are, are coming to areas that have reefs to have those congregations of fish actually in there. So depending on the species, I think there's different strategies based on where those foraging species that don't need to fish, but fish or other species are congregating in that sea. So I don't know if I can answer that question definitively like for every species, but yeah. those are some of the differences where there's where our prey concentrating changes the strategy of where they're feeding or how big their migratory routes are and what part of their life cycle they're at when they're in the tropical waters. And then do we see temperatures dictating where some marine mammals are able to live? Because you think being warm-blooded, they'd be able to cross temperature mm -hmm. gradients, but do we see temperature being one of those factors that influences where they can I, I, it's a, such a timely question. So as far as I know, nobody has documented a shift in their Caribbean or tropical species are, say, in the Caribbean region where I work. But they are shifting, and there's really severe consequences right now as we speak with warming waters in tropical regions, specifically in um, the Amazon rainforest. So there is a die-off occurring right now for dolphins because the waters are too warm and they can't survive. They're dying because it's too hot. So there, it's happening. It's happening in regions. And so it's, it's a huge concern that it could start happening where you have waters that are just not livable for species. It's too hot. And it's too hot and they basically overheat. 
and yeah. exhaustion, like heat exhaustion. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's not a problem that there's no cranking. It's too hot to see a lot to so that's occurring right now. <laughs> what causes marine mammal strandings in the Caribbean? So what we know has been documented is a whole gamut of causes, like many different things. Um, but usually disease is the primary reason for animals to strand in the Caribbean. And there's also um, unknowns in terms of large mass strandings. We know that pilot whales still mass strand in great numbers, and sometimes it's because one animal is sick and others come in. Um, there's been evidence in the Caribbean, this is interesting due to sonar use, that's happened in the Bahamas um, and documented with um, um, beak whales in particular, so that's been documented. Um, and other animals will use themselves due to a membership strike. Kind of building off your PCB's interest, you have the Gulf of Mexico and you have the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Did we see any impacts caused by after using the dispersants on those oils? Impact Caribbean marine mammals? Like that? Did we see anything in their blood chemistry or anything like that? It's a, a good question. I don't know how far south um, animals were sampled, and people had the resources to actually document that type of um, contaminant in the tissues of animals that far south, like outside of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but it did impact animals that were put in Mexico for sure. And those studies are so important to find out what the impacts were obviously animals, but also the people All right, and so we know, as you sent us, and we'll probably put this up on like the screen when it shows the stranding guide you created with the uh, other people who you worked with. How do you, how did the stranding guide help the people uh, take care, better care of the marine animals of stranding? It's so amazing to be in a place where you can still discover species or see them for the first time as a individual who may have been doing this for many years. And there's such uh, nuances sometimes in the different species of marine mammals. So even just documenting the right species can really empower the people of a region to know what they have and understand um, differences in the impacts. Is it only happening to one species or another? Is it uh, a cause or I should say something that happened because you're dealing with an ecosystem-wide effect or there's just one species that's being affected? And that's why stranded animals are so important so you can see what's happening in the environment. So that's been really great to see, just a knowledge of what animal do I have in front of me? Can I identify it with just a two? or a jaw, or uh, I can use this key and identify the exact animal that I have. So then you can start understanding greater population numbers, changes over time, and you can get a better sense of what the ocean health is, what the species health is actually there at that time. And in that sense, it really helps and empowers communities to understand what's happening. So it's all from, you know, just little simple things sometimes that we're moving do you think the Caribbean has a more diverse host of marine mammals than temperate environments? Do you think they, on average, they see a more diverse species when they strand, or do you think it's pretty much equal out, just different? No, there's many species. It's really incredible to see the different species, especially the dolphin species. So, for example, in the Gulf of Maine, we might see three. We might see a white side, a common dolphin, or a bottomless dolphin, maybe a striped dolphin. In the Caribbean, there's many species that you might be able to see that you could get confused. Um, maybe 10 different species or something like that, that it could be one of. So um, it's easy It's easy to identify a humpback whale. Um, but they also have um, uh, brutus whales that look like sea whales that look like another whale species. So you start adding more diversity and it gets harder to identify which is why there's a guide. So there's there's definitely more species there than I think I have seen at one time there than I have seen working for 20 years in the Gulf of Maine. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Then do you think that with that greater diversity, do you think that there's a higher chance that populations will decline? Or do you think, because up here we have our few species, but they're pretty robust. I'm thinking of how humpback whales immediately come to my mind. You know, they're just taking off the endangered species list and stuff like that. Do you think down there, because it's so diverse, that populations fluctuate more 
rapidly? I don't know if we know for sure um, if they're fluctuating more or less because of the numbers that we see or the number of diversity of species. I think that long term or maybe even going back in time and like the archaeological records might be a great way to see what the shifts and changes are through human yeah, sure. genomics or um, go back into museum specimens and see what has shifted and changed or look at the knowledge just of the people there and what they've seen over time. Um, and then also what the impacts might be. So it may not have to do with diversity. It could be um, what species were eaten or what species were taken out by human-caused activities rather than, say, just natural um, changes in our ocean. But it's, it's a great question, I think, it's something that people should look at to see over time how it might change. So if marine mammal populations were to decline, what would you expect the impacts to be on the trout marine ecosystem? Having marine mammals is, we've seen in our lifetimes the decline of the great whales and the smaller species and having just a problem in um, losing just the diversity, ocean diversity, ocean biodiversity. And when we lose diversity in, in any, any realm, terrestrial or, or ocean ecosystem, it impacts those different levers of, of, the, of, our, of our ecosystem and thinking about our food web. Um, and so we know that having lost the whale species in the past, it wasn't just those little strings attached to each other. We're thinking about carbon sleeps and what's happening in our carbon flux cycles and thinking about nutrients coming back up and feeding fish. So there's ample evidence now that when in the past, these animals are in our ocean system and impacted things at a huge scale, like monumental scale. Um, so if we did the same thing and moved everything again, we'd say from the Caribbean region or any of the tropical regions, we'll see that same sort of um, collapse happen. All right. <laughs> so would you say, like, looking at populations of marine mammals in temperate environments compared to populations of marine mammals in Caribbean environments. I like immediately comes to my mind is like killer whales because they're so diverse in population behaviors. Do you see like any noticeable mark when you get to those tropical environments of marine mammal behavior? Like is there a sudden change in what they do than what they do up here? With the question about killer whales and orcas and changes, it's so exciting because we still don't know a lot. There's just only been Again, a couple of papers written, one just came out um, from a great researcher in Venezuela, um, trying to understand, like, where are these animals going? Like, we still don't know. Like, where are they when we don't see them? Um, are they going to Iceland? Are they going down to South America? Um, so we still have so much to learn. All right, to anyone who's watching this, uh, this is the conclusion of the vi uh, video for us. So we have Jess over here, who is our producer. We have Dr. Dre, of course, who is the marine mammal expert that we brought on to talk to. We have Mr. Webb, Aiden Webb over here. My name is Gavin Reinhardt. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dre, for yeah, willing to you. talk to us about this. It was very informative. Is there anything you'd like to say? Thank you. Thank you for, for taking the time. We would like to thank you all for watching. Part of the end of the video was cut off due to technical difficulties, so we apologize for that. Thank you again to Dr. Dre for taking the time to speak with us, and thank you to our audience for listening.